Hello everyone, can you hear me out the back? I think I can hear it. Uh, I'm Mitch and I'm the lead developer of Fable and a few other time series forecasting packages. And I'm here to talk about the recent advancements that I've made since last user into the Fable package. So I'll be talking about some model combinations and some extensibility. So it goes without saying that working with Fable needs to be supported by some other packages. So here are a few that I'll be previewing in this talk, but I'll have to be quick because 15 minutes is very ambitious to talk about everything. Uh, if you are interested, if you're new to the time series world in Tidyverse, uh, this might be a good entry point because I'll introduce from the start right down to some more advanced things. See me later for stickers if you're interested. The Sybil package, uh, I won't be talking much about this. Uh, there's links further down for more information, but it's a modern reimagination of the time series, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about time series data sets. Um, essentially, the existing or standard object for time series, the TS class, looks a bit like this. It's a vector, and it stores meta information with three values, and this isn't suitable for most of our data sets uh, today. It's as if, Keeping in the vector world restricts you to only one column in a data frame, among other restrictions such as not having uh, the flexibility to have regu irregularly spaced uh, observations. So the Tibble data set looks a lot more like this, hopefully familiar to you if you've used Tibble. And we store one column as the index and another column or more columns as our observations. The data set that I'll be looking at is a bit more complicated Instead of just one series, we actually have 304. In the second row of the output, you can see we've disaggregated domestic tourism by three keys, the region, the state, and the purpose of the travel. Because we're in a tabular format, it allows us to use existing tools that you're familiar with to analyze and manipulate your data set. So here I'm using dplyr to, instead of look at 304 series, aggregate it up and only disaggregate it by purpose. So group by purpose, sum up the trips, now gives us only four, uh, four different time series. Because it's in a tabular format or a tidy format, we can also plot this using tools that you already know. And this is our first look at the data. I don't really count this because you can only see a few rows. So you can see that the holiday travel is the most common reason in Australia to travel for tourism. And it's a much more seasonal structure that we would expect. The pattern going up and down regularly is much stronger. Second, we've got visiting, then business purposes, which has an opposite seasonal pattern, and then some other travel reasons below. That's Sybil. The feasts package is good to analyze and understand your data set. So it provides some graphics, some decompositions, and some tools to extract features. Uh, the best resource for this is actually tomorrow. Go see Rob's talk. He'll be talking about feasts. But a quick uh, look at this. We have time series specific plots. A common one is the season plot. And this wraps the x-axis by the seasonal period. In this case, it's a year. And this allows us to see how each quarter changes for each uh, different purpose. You can see that the holiday and visiting travel is most common in quarter one and quarter two because this is Australian data, that's where the heat is, that's summer. So everyone wants to travel, see the, see the beach. And the business travel happens in the second and third quarter uh, when it's a bit colder. We can also decompose our time series into smaller structural components. So here I've taken that trips value, uh, this one up here, and applied a STL decomposition to it using a seasonal window large enough so that it will never change. Uh, you can do more sophisticated decompositions, but the idea is that trips is now the, equal to the sum of the trend, the seasonality, and the remainder. You can, of course, combine this with ggplot to make an appropriate graphic. And here you can see that the trend no longer has our seasonality, and our seasonal pattern highlights how the holiday pattern is stronger, or the holiday series has stronger seasonality. Using this decomposition, we can explore the variances of these uh, separate components in order to generate features for each series. So here I'm using STL features, which will compute uh, useful quantities like the trend strength and the seasonal strength. And you can see from the output, sure enough, the holiday seasonal strength is the strongest. When you've got four series, it's not so valuable. You can look at it on a graph. But remember that we had 304 series to begin with. 
You're going to be very have a lot of trouble plotting that and getting anything useful from it. So features allows you to summarize these time series and visualize them in a compact way. So here, each dot on this plot represents a whole time series. And you can see that the holiday pattern for some time series are stronger than others. That would be the holiday destinations versus the more boring places in Australia. So now we understand the data set that we're looking at, our tourism example. Let's look at some modeling. So the Fable package, if you've heard of the forecast package before, the Fable package is the evolution of that for the tidyverse and the Sybil object. Not only that, but it also makes things more general and more consistent. So uh, hopefully it'll be flexible, as we'll see. A few references there, but hopefully this talk will be a good introduction. So we've already looked at our data. I'm going to use the summarized uh, travel by purpose. And you can see from the output, it's quarterly data. So we've seen that seasonal pattern coming through. An appropriate model for this might be an ETS model, but you can choose many different models. And the interface for this is that we first specify our ETS model, and then we apply it to a data set using the model function. And the output from this gives us a Mabel. And you can see with just a single function, we've actually estimated four separate models. Each row of this Mabel, the model table, corresponds to a, a different separation or disaggregation of the data. Looking at the output, uh, ETS kind of like is error, trend, seasonality. Interestingly, there's no trend models being selected here. So we might want to explore that. To forecast, we use the forecast function and we get a fable. So a fable is a forecasting table. We love it so much, we named the package after it. And an interesting or useful thing about this is that it's now in a tidy data format. Uh, the existing forecast package uh, would have previously had a list structure, and there's a lot of trouble extracting the elements that you want from it. Here you see it, and you can pull it out directly. We have our point forecast in the trips column, and a new addition is a distribution column. Unlike most other modeling packages I've seen, we actually store the entire distribution of our forecasts here, which will allow us to do some pretty fancy things later. Having a look at this, uh, we can plot this using ggplot, and you can see that it's captured some of the structures reasonably. However, there's a change in the trend structure towards the end, which we might want to adapt our model for. So because <coughs> the model function is the way it is, we can actually use it to estimate several models and that adds a separate column in our Mabel. So here I'm comparing an ETS model with no trend against ones with an additive trend. And just for interest, I'm comparing a different model class, the ARIMA model. And we also get a Mabel from this. Plotting this is a, the exact same code, except now I've removed the intervals by setting no levels uh, because it would make the plot too complicated. But this is very powerful to be able to compare uh, several models all in the one workflow. So now that we know Fable and know how to do some introductory forecasts, I want to get to the main topic of the talk. How do we make Fable flexible? A big way in which I make Fable flexible is using combinational forecasting. So this allows you to take separate models or separate sections of the data and put them together. And I like to call this models are better when they work together. And it's simpler. So the simplest way you can combine models and a very common strategy is just to average them. A very simple technique, and we call this ensembling. If you remember our model when we had three separate specifications in it, what would be the natural way to combine these, to take an average? Well, I think you should just add them up and then divide by the total. So in Fable, we support expressions or operations on our models, which allows you to do uh, arbitrary things with your model. Especially notable is combinations, and it doesn't need to be a simple average. You could assign your own weights in this case. And because we're using mutate, we've got a new column for our combination. A big addition to this is actually our combination is a distributional combination. Our ensemble has a distribution behind it. And this is something I haven't seen anywhere else. Interface still works as before. Another less commonly used technique outside of the time series domain is hybrid forecasting. And this is the approach to 
uh, apply a different forecasting technique to different subsets of your data or different components of your data. Remember when we had our STL decomposition, it looked like this, we had some definition for how it was combined. The trips variable was equal to the trend, the seasonality, and the remainder all added together. If instead we did a model for each of these components and then added them together, we should get the trips variable. That's another way we can make a forecast. Most commonly we use the trend plus remainder together, and it looks like this. Here I'm using an ETS model, and it's chosen a non-seasonal ETS model because there's no seasonality left. The seasonal pattern is much simpler. You'll not see from the intervals that they're zero. Um, so we're able to use a seasonal naive pattern here. Two separate models for different components of the data, and we can just add them together. And this will give us a trended and seasonal forecast by using the powers of both models combined. Uh, you'll notice on the y-axis it's a little bit janky. It's not what we want as the trips variable because it's not knowing that rule uh, because we're just using this approach. So we've also got an equivalent technique which doesn't require you to first decompose your data and change the input. You then instead pass the data directly and use a decomposition model, which will first apply the decomposition and then the models to combine it. This is suitable for when you're comparing this against, say, the ETS model on its own, or maybe an ARIMA model. Another way in which we create flexibility is by allowing it to be extensible. So the models that I'm able to make in Fable are, is never going to be comprehensive. Uh, there's always going to be new models, and I can't be the only one to add that. So I'm gonna get other people to help me and implement these models. So I've implemented a couple already. The faster model, which is what I've talked about last year at USAR, and also the profit model, which maybe some of you have heard about. And this allows you to use different modeling tools within the same framework. So you don't need to remember a new interface for a different model class if it is supported in the Fable framework. You can see uh, these two models give us the forecast much the same as before. There's a whole bunch of examples, um, advantages to doing this. In particular, we can look at the accuracy together. Um, you get all of the tools, such as these graphics and combination support that I've covered in the talk, and so much more. So if you do have a time series model, consider adding it to the Fable. So in summary, we've got, uh, this, all, this is the majority of the code that I've covered in the talk. The Sybil data structure is incredible. I think it's uh, suitable for the future of time series. It's a very flexible structure. It works directly with the tidyverse. So if you're new to time series and you're looking to learn about it, you can carry over a lot of the skills that you already have learned. The modeling um, is a very succinct formula notation. If you're familiar with cross-sectional modeling like an LM or GLM or so on, uh, this will feel very natural to you. And it's extensible by design you just add a couple of models. In fact, Fable itself is an extension package to the core tools that are stored in Fable Lite. Combinations are as simple as adding and dividing or doing whatever you need to do with your models, and the forecasts are stored in a data structure that has distributions in it. Thanks to Robin Ira for helping me out with this work, and we're hiring at Monash, so consider joining us, and thanks for listening. Questions, comments, wishes? Thanks for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, impressive packages. Um, my question was about the distributional forecast. What, uh, what kind of uh, structure do you use to, to represent these and um, to, uh, to draw information from them, say, uh, if I want to predict the quantiles from that distribution or probabilities from that distribution, how can I do that? So currently the distribution class stores a few things and we're prioritizing the quantiles uh, rather than the other quantities like sampling or um, the density. Um, we do this because the most commonly, common thing we're interested in with distributions is the intervals. And it's gonna get really complicated because we also support transformations on our response. So we have transformed distributions in a general framework. Um, as for what the distribution stores, it's quite simple and distribution specific. For the normal, you need to know that it's a normal distribution and the method to get the quantiles. 
you need the mean and the standard deviation, and then also automatically we'll handle the transformations if there are any. Um, one day it might be nice to move to a different package for this, like the distributions package is growing really quickly, uh, but we really need that log or general transformation support, which will be really difficult for non-quantile functions. Thank you. Um, thank you for your, your presentation. So I want to ask you about um, model training. So when the models are trained, are they trained in parallel or are they trained sequentially? You've unlocked a bonus slide. Um, so parallel is supported. Here I'm, it's from an example from an earlier version of this talk. Um, we use the future package and if you load in the future and give it a plan, any plan supported by the future package should hopefully work with this. So here I'm actually applying it to 425 series, the full data set, and then expanded some. And do you also have a framework for uh, validating the forecast, as in splitting your sample to a training and a validation set and then comparing forecasts across them, or do you just do that with simple yep. data set? You Oops. kind of get a bonus slide. It's actually the same bonus slide. Oh, maybe it's not, sorry. So forecast accuracy. Because we're in the training, um, we're in the Sybil world, you can filter your own data set into the training set, apply the forecasts over the test set, and then can use the accuracy function, which I've got here, um, onto the full data set, and then it will do this training test split. Uh, you can also do cross-validation using rolling window functions in the Sybil package, and accuracy is the one to use. One final question, short. No? Very quickly, how does Sybil, which I'm not familiar with, compare with the SU infrastructure? Which, with which? SU. SU? Yes. I haven't played around with Smooth, so I can't comment. SU, set, O, O. I haven't played around okay. with that one, sorry. Got it. Thank you all.